Hello, and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute Cancer Immunotherapy and You patient webinar series. I'm your host, Dr. Arthur Bradsky, Senior Science Writer at the Cancer Research Institute. And during today's webinar, we'll be discussing cancer and the microbiome, how bacteria influence our health and immunity. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll hear from a leading immuno immunology expert about this exciting new area of cancer research that deals with how the billions and billions of bacteria that call our body home influence our health. In addition to aiding digestion, these bacteria play a profound role in priming and boosting our immune system. In turn, they, cannot, they can impact not only the development of tumors, but also how cancers respond to treatment. That's why we're going to dive into the latest science of the microbiome, as well as what it tells us about how we can improve human health by rebalancing our inner bacteria. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly thank our generous sponsors who have made this webinar series possible. Bristol Myers Squibb with additional support from Alchemies and Foundation Medicine. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's expert. Dr. Gregory Sonnenberg is an Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology and Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. And last year, Dr. Sonnenberg was one of the first five scientists chosen to be funded through CRI's prestigious new Lloyd J. Old Star program. Thank you, much, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Sonnenberg. Hi, Arthur. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, so let's jump right in. Um, so the microbiome refers to all of the microscopic organisms that live in and on us, um, including, you know, viruses, some fungi, and including, and perhaps most especially, the bacteria that inhabit our gastrointestinal or GI tract in addition to our skin. Um, so referring to the, to the bacteria in our GI tract, it's fairly well known that they're important for digestion, but what do we know about the other beneficial roles of these bacteria, especially when it comes to our immune system? That's a great question, Arthur. So um, when thinking about the microbiome and, and how it impacts human health, I think it's really important to keep a number of important uh, points in mind. Although um, we've always had our microbiome, it's a relatively new area of research. Um, scientists uh, largely ignored the microbiome until the 1990s. Um, however, since then, there's been a rapid appreciation uh, for how important the microbiome can be in impacting numerous aspects of human health beyond just aiding and helping us digest our food. As you alluded to, these can have many uh, diverse different roles in controlling metabolic homeostasis. Uh, they can protect us from infections and even impact very diverse functions outside of our gut, such as our uh, functions within our brain. Uh, many of these diverse processes uh, can be mediated by interactions between the microbiome and our immune system, which is also present in the gut. And to really uh, set the stage for, for this discussion, it's important to keep in mind how, uh, what an astounding diversity and magnitude of microbes the microbiome is. Uh, within the, the average human intestine, it's estimated that there is roughly over 10 trillion uh, microbes. To put that in perspective, that's roughly at a one-to-one at a -one ratio with the total number of uh, cells in our entire body that are human. So really, a number of scientists argue we are just as much microbe walking around as we are human, given how much uh, and how diverse this uh, composition of microbes is uh, that encompasses an, an estimated thousands of, of different species and different forms of life, like you mentioned, beyond bacteria, including fungi and, and protists as well. To deal with, with this amount of bacteria, uh, a majority of our immune system uh, within our whole body is actually found localized uh, within the intestine uh, directly. And there are a number of dynamic and reciprocal interactions between the immune system and the microbiota. This can in turn uh, support the immune system to develop and promote maturation into uh, specific lymphoid tissues throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And this maturation of the immune system is also important in protecting us from infectious pathogens that uh, frequently enter or colonize through our intestine. Conversely, and, and the last point I'll mention is this, this interaction between the microbiome and our immune system also can promote a role in tolerance. And interactions are important in controlling and educating the immune response and, and telling it to not overreact and not uh, promote inflammatory responses to things we wouldn't want it to elicit an immune response to, such as uh, these beneficial microbes or food uh, that we eat within our diet. 
Gotcha. And that's, I, I definitely want to touch on that, that inflammation. Um, but first, you know, I just, I want to go back. It, it's wild that you mentioned that there's just as many bacteria in us as our, our own cells. Um, you know, and it, it's kind of something we, we take for granted. We never, we didn't, you know, even scientists for a long time, we didn't really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, and, and still nowadays, we kind of take it for granted unless something goes wrong and it, it has an effect on us. Um, and so, so you mentioned the positive things, but then you also alluded to the inflammation. Um, and I want to kind of hone in on that because it's kind of the two-sided coin of the microbiome. Um, you know, when, it's, when, it, when there's a healthy balance in the microbiome and it's interacting with the immune system and our tissues properly, uh, you know, they can promote good behaviors and keep us healthy. But if these bacteria, if this, uh, you know, these bacterial colonies, the microbiome become unbalanced, uh, they can promote that inflammation in the intestines that you mentioned. What are the consequences of this inflammation and uh, can it have any effect on cancer? Yeah, that's that's a great uh, question. And um, as you mentioned, there, there's always necessary to have a balancing act between the immune response and the microbiota. Um, the immune response can be activated by this astounding amount of microbes constantly present in our gut. And if that happens uncontrolled, this can drive chronic inflammatory diseases. A great example of this and one that my laboratory works on is inflammatory bowel disease. It also can occur in the context of food allergy if the immune response becomes overreactive to, to things within our diet. And uh, this happens when uh, the immune response becomes really uh, overactive. This uh, chronic inflammation can have direct and local consequences, uh, not only in inflammation, but also in driving cancer development and progression. And we know many patients with inflammatory bowel disease that are at a much greater risk for developing uh, colorectal cancer, if they're, particularly if their disease is left uncontrolled and there's uh, continuous inflammation. But even uh, patients who didn't have a history of inflammatory bowel disease and go on to develop colorectal cancer, this is also causally associated with uh, chronic activation of inflammatory pathways in the intestine and a large part driven by the microbiota itself. This microbiome-driven chronic inflammation can uh, drive cancer through a number of distinct processes, including genomic instability, driving enhanced mutations, and supporting tumor invasion. This is uh, the way I think about it often and rem reminiscent about how uh, chronic infections in general can be associated with cancer. It's known that up to 15% of the worldwide cancer burden is directly driven by infections, and there's very good examples of this in context of viruses and parasites, and in some uh, contexts, even uh, bacterial pathogens. And it's important to, to note the difference, however, between the microbiota and infection, whereas a number of these cancers can be controlled uh, through vaccination or hygiene practices to eliminate these pathogens, our microbiota is always with us, and it's uh, it, uh, you would not want to eliminate with them ever, and be, due to their many normal, uh, numerous beneficial outcomes. So, understanding how the microbiome is contributing to to cancer development is a very emerging area and very important to understand uh, how we can uh, manipulate the microbiome to avoid uh, this cancer progression or induction. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention too is, is that this, this isn't happening just locally in the gut either. Um, we know that uh, abnormal interactions between the microbiota and your immune system uh, in the gut can have many consequences outside of your gastrointestinal tract. It's long been known to be associated with the pathogenesis of many systemic autoimmune diseases in your airway, in your joints, in your skin, in your central nervous system. And there's really strong emerging evidence that these interactions uh, between the microbiome and your immune system can impact cancer at these distal sites from the gut as well. Interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you you, you got up kind of right where I was going to take the conversation. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense that uh, you know the, the microbiome, because it can cause inflammation and interact with our immune system and influence this diversity of processes, as you mentioned, would uh, can can have an influence on the effect on the development of cancer. Um, and, and presumably that could, you know, eventually we might be able to develop some things to help minimize maybe the incidence. Um, but especially for right now, um, you know, once a cancer has developed, obviously the impact of the microbiome, the impact of the microbiome on the immune system and on inflammation and on the cancer don't stop. 
Um, so what do we know? What do we know right now about the microbiome's impact on cancers that have already developed? Um, and can th does the microbiome have any influence on how someone might respond to a treatment like immunotherapy? Yes, definitely. So there is a lot of evidence out there in the scientific community right now that even after tumors are established, the microbiome can contribute to their growth and their progression and their responsiveness to therapies. A lot of this is driven by utilizing uh, preclinical models in mice for a large part, in which you can experimentally deplete the microbiome by giving mice antibiotics, or you can raise mice in a completely sterile environment that's regularly referred to as a germ-free environment, essentially living within a bubble and never being exposed to any type of live uh, microbial stimulation. In a lot of these contexts, it's been found that tumors will grow uh, at a vastly reduced rate, um, suggesting the microbiome is contributing through a number of distinct mechanisms, potentially in, in cancer growth and progression. But the mechanisms of, of how this is happening and how uh, and why this is happening, we don't fully understand yet. And this is one area of active research in my lab. Related to, to immunotherapy that you brought up, that's exactly right. And, and really there was some exciting data that came out only uh, five years or so ago, identifying that uh, mice require the microbiome for uh, their ability to respond to immunotherapies and chemotherapies in some contexts, uh, with a recent notable focus on checkpoint blockade immunotherapies like anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4 uh, therapy. Um, I you know, want to acknowledge this work was done not, not by myself, but by many pioneering groups, many of whom are on uh, the CRI advisory board, Giorgio Tricaneri, Thomas Gajewski, Lawrence Itvogel, Jennifer Wargo, Kenya Honda, just to name a few. Um, you know, really, they had a number of seminal studies that came out uh, highlighting that if you didn't have the microbiome, mice failed to respond to these immunotherapies. And importantly, mice with different compositions of their microbiomes, as you remember, I told you the microbiome contains thousands of different species, so they can have different uh, makeups of this microbiome uh, between mice. Uh, these groups also found that these compositional differences can determine uh, how well a mouse responds to immunotherapy or whether they don't respond at all to immunotherapy. And really critically, um, what was most exciting, I think, about these data is uh, subsequently were translated into human patients and found that uh, patients uh, with different cancers that respond or do not respond to immunotherapies have uh, different compositions of their microbiome. And fundamentally important, the microbiome could be taken from those patients, transplanted into a mouse, and then that mouse uh, would have a similar outcome in immunotherapy, suggesting that that composition of the microbiome is at least in part sufficient and, and necessary to transmit the success or failure of immunotherapies. And so this has been extremely exciting and, and opened up many more questions and answers, but, but provokes that we might be able to use the microbiome to improve immunotherapies for, for cancer patients. Wow, yeah, I mean, when you describe it, it kind of sounds like sci-fi at first, like uh, reminds me of like Einstein's almost action at it's the spooky action at a distance. Um, and so, so I, I, I do, I want to go on, um, I want to unpack what you said about the, uh, the, the bacterial transplants and, and how we're using strategies to potentially help, help cancer patients today. Um, before I do, I want to just pause a little bit on the actual, um, I, I know you mentioned that we are obviously still have a lot to learn about the mechanisms of how these bacteria are influencing the immune system and cancer. Um, but right now, and, and you mentioned also that there's, you know, thousands of bacteria in these. So, re but right now, you know, what is, what does the data tell us about where these uh, benefits to immunotherapy might be coming from? Are they linked to like a certain type of bacteria or is it some property of the microbiome as a whole? Yeah, this is, this is a massively important question. I, I'll call it the million dollar question of, of how this is happening and also which microbes are important. Um, uh, as I've mentioned several times, there's thousands of different species of these microbes. And I think when these initial uh, scientific studies were published, um, although many people were extremely excited about them and, and they massively made an impact in, in the scientific community, 
they were also met with a lot of healthy skepticism. Um, and one mm -hmm. reason for that was that a lot of the uh, microbes that were reported to be important in these papers uh, were different depending on which group uh, was studying them. Um, and this became even more apparent as more publications came out that, that different microbe names were associated with success or failure and not every group uh, arrived at the same microbe. An example of this is that um, some of the microbe names that were found to be beneficial were including microbes termed bifidobacterium, acromantia, uh, bacterioides. And, um, you know, the, the short answer is that, well, all evidence predicts the microbiome is fundamentally important and the composition of the microbiome is important. We still don't really know which microbes um, are important or, or even the how and why uh, they're important is still uh, a big black box at this time, even though we've made progress. And, and this shouldn't really be too disappointing. It was very unlikely to come down to one uh, magic bullet of a single microbe that would be important in immunotherapy. Um, much like uh, all other areas of microbiome research that we and many other people have worked on, the relationship um, of the microbiome is likely very complex, sophisticated, and context-dependent. And there might be many explanations of why we're coming up with different um, microbe names. Um, a lot of this might come down to taxonomy or, or how we classify and name microbes. Um, scientists tend to give microbes name, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every microbe with the same name will have the same function in immunotherapy. Or on the other, uh, other hand, that every uh, microbe with a different name will have different functions in immunotherapy. And so there could be overlapping functions or there could be uh, cooperative actions ac across different uh, consortium of microbes that we don't yet fully understand. And finally, it, it probably is also important to not consider this only in isolation. Um, there may be any, many other modifiers that might control which microbe is important in each individual patient or in each different type of tumor uh, that could include environment or genetics or, or other tumor intrinsic uh, factors. Gotcha. Um, and so now I want to, um, you mentioned in there a little bit, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not about just the presence or absence of one specific type of bacteria. You kind of have to look at the whole, you have to look at the system as a whole. Um, but I know that one of the kind of, one of the factors I've seen that has popped up is, as, uh, you know, that has correlated with better outcomes for patients is a higher diversity of gut bacteria. Um, and I know that, um, that some studies showed that patients who had antibiotics, who, who were on antibiotics had a lower diversity of gut bacteria. And that was associated with, uh, <clears throat> with a higher, with, with worse outcomes, these, these uh, less diverse bacteria. But at the same time, um, other studies have showed, you know, I guess the flip side of that, would, people might think, um, well, if, if in this, this context of cancer, you know, obviously antibiotics are very important in a lot of contexts, but when you, if you're about to get an immunotherapy and an antibiotic might not be the best thing for you. But at the same time, you know, the flip side of that, some people might think, oh, uh, maybe then probiotics will be good because they'll boost my, my gut bacteria. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. I was, I was wondering if you could kind of dig into that and talk about, um, talk about these complexities as far as antibiotics and probiotics. Yeah, those are all great questions. And, and the frustrating part, I think, is we, we don't yet know how to advise patients on how to manipulate their microbiome uh, to have a better outcome of their immunotherapy. And, um, you know, it's remarkable we're even having this conversation, I think, given that, that the discovery of the importance of the microbiome in um, cancer immunotherapies only came out five years ago. And so the, the research is moving really at a very rapid um, and exciting pace. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a number of considerations to be made, like you raised was antibiotics and, and generally in, in most disease contexts, um, it's important to have a higher diversity of microbiome. Generally, higher diversity translates to less inflammation and better, um, better outcome of host microbiota uh, interactions. So certainly, I think many physicians are, are now aware of this. Um, while there's an astounding number of benefits to antibiotics, I think many are considering of when is the most appropriate time to administer them if needed, particularly in the context of individuals who, who might be getting immunotherapy. Um, I know there's many different ongoing studies of 
fig trying to figure out when the timing of antibiotics would potentially impact immunotherapy, either beneficially or detrimentally. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's still at, at very early stages um, to, to be able to address this. The other important point you raised was, was um, taking probiotics. Um, there's definitely literature out there that actually taking a probiotic, although it's generally thought to be a beneficial um, therapy in modulating the microbiome or, or thought to be giving us more diverse microbiome, uh, there's actually data emerging in a number of scientific studies that can actually have a detrimental impact on your microbiome. And so this term probiotic may not necessarily always be good. And in some contexts, may even potentially impair your responsiveness uh, to therapies. But, um, you know, probably what we're doing already, a number of different uh, things that your physician would likely advise you to do are um, benefiting our microbiome in ways, even though um, it may not be why they told you to do this, such as uh, adopting a healthier diet uh, and do, having regular exercise, avoiding smoking and alcohol. Uh, many of these pathways are probably modifying our microbiome that will help us uh, fight cancer. Um, an example of this related to the diet, you know, decreasing red meat intake, increasing fiber um, are all known to be associated with reducing cancer risk. And, and I think more and more studies are going to be coming out soon that they will um, play a role in benefiting uh, anti-cancer therapies and, and apart uh, by changing our microbiome. So it's, it's frustrating and a bit disappointing to say, um, certainly on my end, that we don't yet know how to advise patients how to change their microbiome to, to impact uh, cancer immunotherapies. But we're making really tremendous uh, advances. And I think um, this is why it's so important to continue to support basic and, and translational research so that we can get to these answers, uh, hopefully in the near future. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, get, getting that, that fundamental bedrock upon which we can build upon and, and develop new treatments, I think is, it will definitely be important. Um, so, you know, throughout this time, we've been talking about how, you know, it is, it's so hard to tease apart where are these effects coming from? What are these positive effects coming from? Um, and so one of the, you know, now while we're still at this, before we have those specific answers, um, one, of the, one of the approaches that we're testing to help patients is what you mentioned earlier, that bacterial transplant or which goes by FMT, which stands for fecal microbiota transplant, um, which some people might find a pretty weird and even disgusting concept. Um, but in the, now, since we can't um, you know, isolate those beneficial parts of the microbiome, now we can just, the, I guess, until then, the solution or, or one of the solutions that's being investigated is to transfer the entire microbiome. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk, you could explain a little bit more about how FMTs work, um, and especially how they're being uh, explored in clinical trials right now for people. Sure, that's a you know a really great point. Uh, this fecal microbiota transplantation, or or FMT, as you said, is is one method um, of being able to take one individual's microbiome and transfer it to to a new individual and and see if that has a beneficial role. Um, it has shown success in other clinical. Uh, clinical context, um, although it's thought to be a relatively uh, crude uh, method, is um, very notably effective in patients who develop Clostridium uh, difficile infection. And one uh, context of why individuals uh, get this infection routinely is a loss of this diversity in microbiota that we talked about before, and restoring this microbiota diversity with uh, fecal microbiota transplantation is a very effective way to treat and, and routinely cure um, this infection, and it has certainly benefited a number of patients. In terms of using this more for cancer and, and potentially using it to benefit immunotherapies, um, uh, we don't know. There are clinical trials ongoing. It is hopeful that uh, doing this FMT method will provide some benefit. There are a number of questions that, again, we still don't know the answers to of, of where do we get the donor uh, microbiota from? Do you use simply a healthy individual who doesn't have cancer? Or do you take uh, microbiota from a cancer patient that had a big and successful uh, response to immunotherapy and give that to a new patient and hope that their microbiota will then transmit this effective immunotherapy response? 
or even there's there's discussions of should you when you're young and healthy uh, be saving samples of your own microbiome uh, that you can that then might be able to utilize later on in life if you have a loss of diversity or or need a, a healthy microbiota uh, transplantation. Um, you know, hopefully, although these FMT studies will likely show us some success or or failure. You know, the, I think the ongoing goal is to to move beyond this crude method, and and uh, as we identify more specific microbes or a consortia of microbes that show promising results in preclinical models, to be able to use them uh, more in clinical trials and and deliver more selective and specific and and well defined uh, microbial based therapies that are both safe uh, and effective. Uh, but some of this, again, might come down to not considering this in isolation. It's probably going to come down to which tumor types are important and other uh, environmental modifiers uh, that might be uh, patient-specific. Absolutely. I was hoping now you could just kind of leave us with, you know, what, what do you think, what are the, the most pressing questions in the field? And what, what hopes do you have for the next few years as far as some of these approaches Sure. I, I think, you know, this is a very important question of, of where do we go from here now that there are some basic fundamental scientific observations. And I think there's a really good opportunity to, to try and move this quickly into the clinic. Um, but before we can do that, I think, you know, we, we've said many more of these questions and answers already of exactly how this is happening, which microbes are important, how are they functionally impacting um, immunotherapy responsiveness, and how do we transplant them and deliver them uh, to patients to uh, improve the effectiveness of the therapies and really fight cancer. Um, you know, we're not limited only with transfer. Um, we talked about diet a bit, and this may be one of the most successful ways to manipulate the microbiome. The microbiome is always continuously responding to what we eat, and so there may be uh, easy and straightforward methods to manipulate the microbiome through diet uh, to provide the most uh, therapeutic benefit in the context of immunotherapies. It may also be important, I think, in the immediate future to potentially be able to utilize the microbiome as a, a biomarker or predictor of which patients in advance might succeed or fail in the context of anti-cancer therapies or particularly uh, often there can be side effects of these anti-cancer therapies and the microbiome might also be an important predictor for determining which individuals might be more susceptible to these adverse outcomes as well. There's also many other important areas of microbiome research. Something we didn't have time to talk too much about today is that particularly cancers that have impact the gastrointestinal tract like gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer are largely unresponsive to these revolutionary uh, checkpoint blockade immunotherapies. This is really surprising in, in an area my lab uh, is regularly working on is why these tumors are, are uh, not responding quite as well. And you might argue these tumors are probably likely most in direct contact with the microbiome. And so we think there could be many essential questions there of why the microbiome is, is not able to support uh, immunotherapy response and, and clinical benefit. Um, it may also be important to um, talk about microbiome outside of the gut as well, uh, which we didn't have too much time to talk about today. Certainly the, the intestine contains the most and majority of our microbiome, but there's also microbes colonizing uh, many other parts of our body, like the skin, the airway, and um, even a recent high impact publication came out that tumors themselves, um, in a study of 1500 different uh, tumors from different individuals, uh, can be colonized with the microbiome, and the microbiome can be found within the tumor cells themselves, as well as within the immune cells themselves within the tumors. So understanding where the microbiome is important and, and how we might be able to harness that is also uh, fundamentally important and could explain a lot of the variability and in, in therapeutic responsiveness of uh, variability of responsiveness of tumors to, to different types of therapies. Um, finally, I think, you know, the, the microbiome is, is probably not the only way to fight cancer and, and cannot act in isolation. And so it's very important to consider this 
um, in the context of environment, lifestyle, genetics, um, tumor microenvironment, uh, as we talked about. And it will be important to integrate uh, the microbiome into all of these uh, aspects of cancer research for a broader understanding of these pathways in order to determine how we can really effectively harness the microbiome to fight cancer. Yeah, that, that is amazing. When you <laughs> talked about the, uh, that recent discovery that the bacteria within tumors, it's, that's mind blowing. Like it's, you know, it's all, it's so complex enough already. And then the, here's this new discovery that they colonize the tumor cells too. It really, you know, it really drives home how, how profound this, this area is and how much we still have to learn about it. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that with people like you uh, working on it, hopefully we can make some progress that can eventually help patients. Um, so, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you, Dr. Schoenberg. We, uh, covered a lot and I hope our patients and caregivers found it as enlightening as I did. For more of our webinars and the additional resources we have for patients and caregivers as part of CRI's Answer to Cancer ed educational programs, we encourage you to check out our website at cancerresearch.org slash patients. Here, you can read and watch stories shared by others who have received immunotherapy treatment across a wide variety of cancer types. You can register for one of our immunotherapy patient summits, browse our entire library of past webinars featuring the world's leading immunotherapy experts, access information on other resources, including treatment, emotional support, and financial assistance, and you can help find help locating an immunotherapy clinical trial. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors one last time for making this webinar series possible. Bristol Myers Squibb with additional support from Alchemies and Foundation Medicine. And thank you all for your attention today. Uh, I, re I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar. And again, you can watch this and all of our other webinars on our website at cancerresearch.org slash webinars to learn more about the immunotherapy options and research uh, in a number of cancer types. Dr. Sonnenberg, I just want to thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us today uh, and for the amazing work that you're doing to advance our understanding of this really, really complex relationship between bacteria, the immune system, and cancer. We wish you the best of luck. My pleasure. Thank you.